Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure I'm, uh, to welcome you to Harvard Law School uh, and to this wonderful, wonderful occasion. I am Martha Minow. I'm the dean here. And I do some things every day that I have to do, and some things I think, OK, I'll do it. And some things I think, yes, I'm so excited. And that, this is one of those. So it's with enormous pride that I welcome you as we honor Professor Vicki Jackson on her appointment as the inaugural Thurgood Marshall Professor of Constitutional Law. <laughs> I first want to welcome some special guests. Uh, we are joined by several members of Vicki's uh, family and friends, including her husband, Robert Taylor, who is a member of the class of Harvard Law School 1975 and is also acting counsel, acting general counsel of the U.S. Department of Defense, and they did let him out um, as the government closed. Uh, and also their son, uh, Michael J uh, Taylor, who's a second-year associate at Paul Weiss in New York, and Vicki's brother-in-law, Alan Taylor, another member of the Harvard Law School class of 1975, who is the chair of the Connecticut State Board of Education. His wife, who's a community volunteer and activist, Sally Taylor. Vicki's daughter-in-law, Emily Harrows, a public health PhD student at Johns Hopkins, who is married to Vicki and Bob's son, Jacob. And Emily's parents, Mike, uh, who is uh, the class of 1970 Harvard Law School, and Elizabeth Edmonds, also an attorney, and Vicki's cousins, uh, Eleanor Schur and Peter Joseph, and uh, their daughters, Anna and Eleanor, attend Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School, respectively. Now, we don't require our professors to have so many connections to Harvard and Harvard Law School, but it makes it particularly sweet uh, on this occasion. I, I also want to give a warm welcome to Vicki's friends, including Susan Lowe Block, professor of law at Georgetown and co-author with Vicki of their new uh, book. Uh, is Lincoln Kaplan here? Did I see him? There he is, there he is, great. Also, class of 1976, founder and editor-in-chief of Legal Affairs Magazine, Susan Liss, executive director of the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and Mary Chitty, who is a scientific research librarian and Vicki's college roommate. Now, how many of you know where your college roommate is, much less would your college roommate come uh, and she came uh, because they bonded uh, over the experience of transferring to and thus integrating Yale College as among the very first women uh, in 1969. So we have a kind of special reunion here today as Vicki, Allen, and Susan are all former co-clerks of the chair's namesake, Justice Thurgood Marshall. So that's also really very, very special. Before I brag about Vicki and make her get embarrassed, uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about the chair with which she's being honored. American author and aviator Anne Morrow Lindbergh once said, to give without any reward or any notice has a special quality of its own. And it is, is with recognition of the very special quality of anonymity that we express our gratitude for a gift that makes this professorship possible. In November 2009, Harvard Law School received a big gift, $10 million, made anonymously, I don't know who it's from, in honor of Professor Lawrence Tribe, class of 1966. Now, many of our faculty have done wonderful things for the school. I don't think there's a single one who's done anything quite like that, Larry. That's pretty outstanding. It's one of the largest gifts ever received by Harvard Law School. And in Larry's honor, this chair uh, is established to bring to this faculty outstanding individuals in constitutional law. Now, when it comes to pass, which I hope never happens, that Professor Tribe is no longer on the faculty or he retires, this chair will be known as the Lawrence H. Tribe Professorship of Constitutional Law. But until that time, and at the request of Professor Tribe, the professorship is known as the Thurgood Marshall Professorship of Constitutional Law. And Pref Professor Tribe said, being able to designate Thurgood Marshall, whom I regard as the greatest American lawyer of the last century, is most gratifying to me. When I learned of this chair with this name, I had one and only one person in the country that I wanted for this chair, and it was Vicki Jackson. 
And so in addition to funding the chair, uh, the, the funds actually enable conferences, uh, one, one of which the Vicki is busily uh, planning, and other symposium and, and scholarly activities. And I think maybe it tipped the balance, or maybe it was your husband, Bob. Somehow we convinced you to come. And it's so with an enormous thrill uh, that the very first holder of this chair, named for Supreme Court Associate Justice Thurgood Marshall, is one of his former clerks. In the years since that clerkship, Vicki Jackson has built a remarkable career as one of the leading experts in the world in comparative constitutional law, in federalism, in gender and the law. Vicki brings meticulous care, thoughtful engagement, fresh perspective to everything she does. And let me tell you, she does a lot. So settle, set it, settle in and, you know, okay, settle in. I have lots to say. Vicki served uh, as a professor of constitutional law at Georgetown University, where she taught courses on constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, gender equality, federal courts, and Supreme Court for more than 25 years. And she also visited here as the Felix Frankfurter visiting professor and as the Thurgood Marshall visiting professor. She also visited at Columbia Law School. Uh, and she, um, at Georgetown, was also the associate dean for transnational legal studies. That's where we first came to know each other well in talking about curricular reform. And her work in innovative reforms actually set the standard in the country. She also chaired the Appointments Committee and the Academic Standards Committee. And she invented Georgetown's week one faculty group through which she designed uh, a required first year course in transnational legal problems. She is a, a, a recipient also of Georgetown's Frank Flegel Award for Excellence in Teaching. But now we have to go back before that, because before joining that faculty, Vicki built on her uh, experience in law school and as a clerk to become an outstanding practitioner. She was an associate and then a partner at the firm of Rogovin, Hugie, and Lenzner in Washington. And she also uh, became uh, very involved in professional work following her clerkships both at the Supreme Court and for Judge Morris Lasker at the Southern District of New York in uh, her civic activity. She has served as a board member of the International Association of Constitutional Law since 1999 and the International Association of Women Judges. She's currently a member of the Academic Advisory Committee for the National Association of Women Judges. And she took a leave from Georgetown where to take a position as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, where she also, uh, uh, actually I'm still stumbling across things that you did while you were there. She was also counsel and helped draft the law professor's uh, Miki brief in the, in the Supreme Court of the United States case, United States versus Morrison, that dealt with the challenge to the constitutionality of the Violence Against Women Act. And this past year, most recently, in addition to teaching her courses uh, and doing her scholarship and doing her civic work, Vicki was uh, recruited by the United States Supreme Court, um, recruited, I don't know, commanded, to uh, t take on another assignment. The court appointed her uh, uh, to, to produce the amicus curia brief in the United States versus Windsor, Windsor, the landmark case that challenged the constitutionality of the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act and, and gave Vicki an assignment uh, uniquely uh, right in the area of her expertise dealing with federal courts um, and it uh, addressed the question of whether or not the court had jurisdiction in the case. Now, some people get assignments um, and you know say thank you, no, I already, my plane is full, not Vicki. She rearranged her whole life to do this and to do this on a tight time frame. And I know that the justices were incredibly impressed by this work because I've heard that from several of them personally. Um, that selection by, that, by the court for that very special role is just one of the many, many indications of the high regard in which her, uh, her, her extraordinary work is uh, regarded. Um, high regard which is regarded. Can someone help me with that sentence? Okay, you'll, you'll help me. There's so many other things that you do, Vicki, and I, I don't want to take more of your time um, because I want to give some, uh, for you to give your talk, the reason that people are here, but just, I have just two more to say. She, she has been a pivotal member of the executive session for state court leaders for the 21st century, uh, which is a project of the Kennedy School and the Center for State Courts, and her work uh, on the um, 
gender, race, and ethnic bias committees for the DC bar um, actually became a model for the rest of the country. Her scholarship is magnificent. Uh, her absolutely landmark book, Constitutional Engagement in a Transnational Era, has transformed the way that I think in this country and others, people talk about what does it mean to look at foreign law. Uh, does it mean that you follow it slavishly? No. Does it mean that you learn about your own values? Yes. Um, how do we do it? Read the book. Um, <laughs> she's also collaborated with uh, faculty colleague Mark Tushnet on two crucial works uh, that help to shape the field of comparative constitutional law. Comparative constitutional law, 2006, second edition, and the scholarly essays defining the field of comparative constitutional law. She edited, co-edited the book on federal court stories, bringing human beings into the field of uh, federal courts, and uh, co-authored with Sue Block and Tom Kattenmaker, Inside the Supreme Court, the Institutions and its Procedures, and then most recently, this marvelous, marvelous book with Sue, Federalism, a Reference Guide to the United States Constitution, which was uh, endorsed by Harry Edwards, Senior Circuit Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, who said in reviewing the book, and I quote, the authors illuminate the evolution of the concept of federalism, its importance over the centuries, and the vital dynamic role it continues to play today. It is a masterful effort. Students, practitioners, jurists, and scholars will gain great profit from this sterling work for years to come. Vicki's work as articles editor for ICON, the International Journal of Constitutional Law, uh, her work with many, many, many journals. I, I can go on and on, and I swear, I really am going to stop, but not without quoting a few of uh, your colleagues who just have some things to say. Mark Tushnet says, in our work on comparative constitutional law, Vicki Jackson has played the fox to my hedgehog. Her attention to nuance, detail, and context has been an important counterweight to my tendency to generalize. Her approach has affected the way I think about law, and I believe that the synergies between our perspectives contributed a great deal to the success of our project and casebook. Dan Meltzer. Vicki presents a marvelous blend of talents. She is superb, hard-headed, and rigorous lawyer, an imaginative thinker with seemingly endless supply of new and challenging perspectives a cosmopolitan expert in constitutional systems around the world, and a person with an unwavering commitment to bend the arc of the law toward justice. In addition, he adds, she has been a wonderful friend for 35 years, and so I couldn't be more delighted that she has joined our community, which she has already greatly enriched. Richard Lazarus. Vicki Jackson is the scholar scholar. She wonderfully combines her unending curiosity about law and its potential to promote social justice with her unbending commitment to rigorous and honest legal analysis. Notwithstanding all of the intellectual rich richness of which Harvard Law School can justly boast, it is that much richer still with Vicki Jackson as part of its community. Richard Fallon. Among Vicki's very many virtues as a scholar, she is tru a truly marvelous reader. Her readings of both judicial opinions and scholarly commentary are invariably insightful and occasionally eye-popping. Vicki is equally adept at drawing imaginative comparisons among the reasons I think that she stands at the top of the field of comparative international law. As a colleague, Vicki is also stunningly generous and helpful. There is no one whom I would rather have as a reader of and commentator on my work. And Carol Steiker. Vicki is an extraordinarily engaging colleague who has already proven to be an indispensable resource for discussing everything from scholarship to institutional politics. How did we ever live without her? <laughs> How indeed. Vicki Jackson, my uh, friend, my advisor, mentor to many, I am thrilled to welcome you here to give your chair talk. believe everything you hear. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dean Minow, for your more than, and all my colleagues uh, and friends here for your <clears throat> more than generous remarks. I am very, very happy to be here with you today uh, to honor Justice Thurgood Marshall, one of the great heroes of U.S. law. I feel very privileged to hold a chair in his name for now and hope that continues for a long time and very privileged to be associated 
with Professor Larry Tribe, whose name I will invoke shortly. Soon after his resignation from the court, I went to an event in honor of Justice Marshall at Howard University. It was attended by several other justices, including Justice Souter. When offered the chance to speak, Justice Souter commented that it was rare for someone to be and be recognized as a prophet in his own time. My lecture today recognizes that Justice Marshall as Justice Souter suggested, was such a prophet. As I connect one of Justice Marshall's signature positions in favor of a more flexible approach to standards of review and equal protection claims with a growing international literature on proportionality, reprising to some extent older debates about rules, standards, and balancing in light of this new literature, I argue that US constitutional law would benefit from greater clarity about and some greater use of the principle of proportionality as it has been elaborated around the world. Now, Americans are quite familiar with the principle of proportionality in constitutional law. The Eighth Amendment's case law has long recognized that punishments that are grossly disproportionate violate the cruel and unusual punishment clause. While the court's willingness to actually scrutinize the proportionality of sentences has uh, at best varied, uh, since the 1990s, the court has invoked proportionality across many other issue areas. Under the Due Process Clause, courts must now ensure that the measure of punitive damages in civil cases is, quote, both reasonable and proportionate to the amount of harm to the plaintiff and the general damages recovered. Under the Takings Clause, conditions for zoning permits must be, quote, roughly proportional, close quote, to the effects of the proposed use of the property. And the, quote, undue burden, close quote, standard is now controlling in the court's abortion cases. Uh, all of these invoke proportionality in resolving individual rights questions, as does Justice Breyer's 2012 concurrence in the Stolen Valor First Amendment case. The court has also extended proportionality into federalism. As of 1997, legislation under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment must be, quote, congruent and proportional to conduct that Section 1 prohibits. As these examples show, US courts, like judges in constitutional cases around the world, have found the concept of proportionality increasingly attractive in resolving interpretive challenges. Scholars like my colleague Dick Fallon have begun to identify the roots of proportionality in US constitutional law. Uh, Professor Fallon drawing comparisons between US strict scrutiny as it developed in the 1970s and European proportionality law. Uh, Professor Stone, Sweet, and Matthews seeing proportionality review as early as 19th century dormant commerce clause cases. I want to say the principle of proportionality is implicit in our constitutional design. The Federalist Papers describe the Constitution as designed to produce, quote, a wise and well-balanced government that will help control, quote, abuses and avoid, more quoting, the exercise of arbitrary and vexatious powers. Indeed, I suggest proportionality as a goal is implicit in any Constitution that aims to produce justice by limiting as well as empowering government. But recognizing proportionality as a general principle of constitutional government does not necessarily imply that the way to achieve proportionality is through judicial review. The principal protection against abuse of taxation, the court has said, is through its linkage to representation. Legislative and executive actors may have obligations to act proportionally. What then is the role for judges in implementing the constitutional value of proportionality? In some countries, not ours, proportionality review is a highly developed judicial doctrine that's used to evaluate all rights-based challenges to government action. We have not adopted such a pervasive doctrine, but expanded, some expanded use of proportionality would have real advantages, I will argue, in uh, Fourth Amendment and equal protection contexts. These are exemplary. At the end of my talk, I will raise a question about how to distinguish those issues best decided by case-by-case -case application of proportionality standards, or those better handled through the development of proportionate categorical rules. Now, in other countries, general limitations clauses have been understood to invite courts to review justifications for government action through proportionality analysis. An example, section one of Canada's Charter of Rights provides that the rights therein are guaranteed, quote, subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. 
Judicial doctrine has developed a proportionality test to determine whether this standard is met. So if you're in Canada or Germany or Israel or a number of other jurisdictions, the first inquiry is into the scope of interests that a right protects. Then, if the court finds the government is acting with proper authority and towards a legitimate end, the court asks whether the law infringing on those interests is justified. At the justificatory stage, courts turn to proportionality focusing on a three-part test to evaluate the means used, rationality, minimal impairment, and proportionality as such are the three steps. Rationality is quite similar, similar to US rational basis review. The minimal impairment step has at times been articulated as a cognate test to the US least restrictive alternative requirement in strict scrutiny. However, minimal impairment does not necessarily imply that if any less restrictive approach can be imagined, the law is invalid. Rather, foreign courts have looked to see whether there's an obvious and workable alternative, sometimes drawing on approaches already in use by the government. In cases involving more polycentric interests, minimal impairment scrutiny has allowed considerable latitude. One example. In a case called Edwards Books in 1986, the Canadian Supreme Court upheld an Ontario statute establishing Sunday as a common day of recreation that most retail businesses had a close for. The statute had an exception for employers who closed for the Sabbath on Saturday and had fewer than seven employees. But several Ontario retailers, including some owned by observant Jews, challenged the statute. They argued, that the approach taken in New Brunswick, another province, was less impairing of religious freedom rights. New Brunswick provided an exception for any retailer with a sincere religious belief that they needed to close on a day other than Sunday. But the court wasn't persuaded which approach was less impairing. New Brunswick did make the exemption available regardless of how many employees, but Ontario did not require the employer to prove sincerity of religious belief. So a small shopkeeper employing observant Jews could benefit from the exemption regardless of the employer's belief. The court likewise found another proposed alternative that individuals be allowed to invoke the exemption was not necessarily less impairing of rights given the social and economic pressures on employees not to assert those rights. Given the complexity of the rights holders' interests as owners, employees, and consumers, the court could not conclude that one approach was less impairing of rights than the other, and so Ontario's law stood. Now, the third stage of analysis is sometimes called proportionality as such, and it asks whether the government's reasons for regulating and the degree to which they are likely to be served can justify the harm to constitutionally protected interests. By going beyond rationality and minimal impairment, the proportionality as such question can make the doctrine more rigorous than US strict scrutiny, which ends after the least restrictive means test. While proportionality review requires an initial evaluation at the very beginning that the government's purpose is legitimate and sufficiently important to warrant some restriction, in the final stage, the relative strength of that interest is brought into relation with the specific harm to rights. The greater the intrusion on rights, the greater must be the legitimate need for the challenged measure. Now I'll illustrate with an example from Israel. In the Beit Surik case, the court found that the government had a legitimate purpose in building a fence to protect Israelis from violent attacks from occupied territories. Locating the line at the top of a hill, the court found, was rational towards the goal of protecting residents from being shot at. The line drawn was also minimally impairing of the rights of Palestinians fenced off from their own lands because no other route could achieve an equivalent level of security. However, the court held, the fence had to be moved down the hill, allowing Palestinians more access to their lands because the fence location failed the final proportionality as such test. The marginal improvement to security from having the fence at the top of the hill as compared to the line in a lower location was, in that court's view, much less than the marginally greater intrusions on Palestinian human rights from having it at the top of the hill. 
Now, the Israeli court was very clear in explaining that less restrictive means, that was their language, refers only to an alternative that, quote, equally advances the law's purpose while intruding less on rights. Uh, when U.S. courts refer to least restrictive means, they tend not to specify whether the analysis requires that the measures being compared equally advance the compelling interest. So in Alvarez, the stolen valor case, the plurality accepted as a less restrictive means to a criminal prohibition on lying about receiving uh, military medals the creation of an online database against which false claims could, in theory, be checked. But the analysis left unclear whether the idea was the database would be equally effective towards the government's legitimate goals, or instead, even if less effective, would be a sufficient alternative given the relatively greater importance of free speech concerns. The relative importance of the rights and values at stake is evaluated in Israel, Canada, and elsewhere distinctly at the proportionality as such stage. Now this stage has been criticized as balancing that uh, Jurgen Habermas says is irrational, a terrible thing, because it requires that incommensurables lacking a common metric be somehow weighed. Others, however, have argued that a common metric is actually not required to be able to make reasoned judgments about relative values. Uh, David Luban has talked about what he calls large, small trade-offs involving a small sacrifice of one value for a large gain in another. It may well be a mistake to understand balancing in mathematical terms at all. Indeed, proportionality as such may entail much more of a reasoning process about the priority of one constitutional value vis-a-vis -vis another in a particular setting. Finally, it's worth noting in proportionality analysis abroad, uh, the proportionality as such question is the last in a sequence of inquiries, much more structured than sort of all things considered balancing. Now, as I've mentioned, the U.S., while embracing elements of proportionality, uh, treats these tests in different areas as completely unconnected. Uh, this is related to a more general propensity for what John Hart Ely and others have critically called clause-bound interpretation. Unlike some European courts, especially in civil law contexts that value systematicity in law, a U.S. constitutional case law, for the most part, has not aspired to theoretical connections linking one area to another. And proportionality has not been articulated here as part of a larger principle, even when it informs creation of categorical rules. Uh, there are several other reasons for this. First, U.S. law does not generally conceive of rights as subject to external limits. When we say a right has been infringed, that's the end of the analysis. Elsewhere, the scope of interest the rights protect is determined first and from the perspective of the rights holder. If the right is infringed, analysis does not end. The government's reasons for limiting the right are then considered. Here, we blend the two and only articulate a right after internally accounting for the government interest. Second, and relatedly, the U.S. Constitution doesn't have any general limitations clause, as other modern constitutions do, that would provide a textual basis for a more general doctrine about justifying limits. Third, the U.S. Constitution, at least as conventionally understood, contains fewer rights and thus fewer occasions for conflicts in constitutional principles than many other constitutions, especially those modern ones that enforce both older liberal rights and newer positive rights. So where constitutional rights are many and are viewed as principles requiring optimization, as in Germany, approaches that seek to give each principle its proportional due are likely to have great appeal. But in the United States, conflicts between constitutional values, think fair press free trial, they exist, but they are perceived to arise less often. Finally, there are a distinctive set of American fears about judging uh, that make some suspicious of proportionality tests. And we might think of these as the ghosts of Lochner and dentists. Ghosts whose power, I want to suggest, should be diminished by what we've learned from comparative experience. Caroline Products laid the foundation for the courts developing bifurcated standards of review, more deferential review for economic regulation, heightened review for laws adversely affecting discrete and insular minorities, the representative process, or the protections of the first eight amendments. 
This bifurcated approach, as Professor Fallon has brilliantly suggested, was an attempt to respond to fears of Lochnerism by creating a more clear hierarchy of rights that would define and divide the realm of intensive judicial scrutiny from the realm of more deferential scrutiny. Now, the exact vices of Lochner are debated, but the Caroline products and bifurcating standards of review responds to most of these concerns. It appeared to limit judicial intrusion on political choices except in circumscribed areas. It rejected economic liberties as an object of heightened attention, and it sought to confine judicial discretion by committing the court to two discrete outcome determinative standards of review, strict scrutiny, almost always fatal, rational basis review, rarely so. But over time, the persuasive and predictive force of this bifurcation has diminished. The very concept of a rigid division in standards of review was criticized as early as Justice Thurgood Marshall's 1970 dissent in Dandridge against Williams, where he argued that defining the level of benefits for children and poor families was not the kind of economic regulation of commercial enterprises on which the Caroline products distinction rested. The debate has continued. Think about, uh, you know, is sexual orientation a suspect or a quasi-suspect uh, classification? With the addition of intermediate scrutiny and unexplained variations in the application of both rational basis and strict scrutiny review, the sense of predictability that these tiers may once have had brought is diminished. Uh, moreover, recent years have seen resurgence of constitutional protection for economic rights, takings jurisprudence, and commercial speech cases. Uh, Dennis, 1951 decision and the apparent failure of balancing in Justice Frankfurter's hands to provide appropriate protection to First Amendment interests contributed to the development of a more categorical approach to evaluating restrictions on speech in Brandenburg v. Hayes. And this development in turn contributed to a more general idea that U.S. constitutional law consists of categorical rules. Now to the extent Brandenburg focuses on Evaluating the speaker's words, it's not a test of proportionality of anything. But concerns for proportionate government action inform the development of Brandenburg's categorical rule in order to attain a more correct balance between allowing society to protect itself against future harm and securing freedom of speech, the test was adopted. However, numerous exceptions in recent years, perhaps including Holder against humanitarian law, create a more complex and less determinate overall structure. So as our categorical rules have become increasingly complex, perhaps the door is open for some reorientation of US law, uh, and I want to illustrate the possible benefits of case-by-case -case proportionality analysis in the context of a Fourth Amendment case. You may think this is too easy a case for the claim, but so be it. In Atwater against the city of Lago Vista, the court found no Fourth Amendment violation in arresting a motorist for a traffic offense that could not be punished with any jail time. Simplified version of the facts. Ms. Atwater is driving with her two young children in their neighborhood. She is stopped by a police officer for not having her kids in seatbelts. The officer approaches the car and yells at her, you're going to jail. He had previously stopped her in the same neighborhood, mistakenly thinking she had committed a seatbelt offense. One of her kids had climbed in the seatbelt up and was leaning out, you know, out the window. The kids do this. Arresting Ms. Atwater, the officer denied her request to ask a neighbor to care for the children, indicating that he would bring the kids into custody as well. Fortunately, a neighbor happened to pass by and took charge of the kids. Ms. Atwater's hands were cuffed behind her back. She was then placed in the back of the police car and driven with no seatbelt on to the station. She was released about an hour later and paid a $50 fine for the seatbelt offense, but she incurred substantial other costs because her car was towed. She sued for damages. Here's the court's description of the police officer's conduct. It involved merely gratuitous humiliations, inflicting pointless indignity and confinement. Indeed, the court said, her claim clearly outweighs anything the city can raise against it specific to her. And, the court said, if we were to derive a rule exclusively to address the uncontested facts of this case, Atwater might well prevail. She was a known resident of Lago Vista with no place to hide and no incentive to flee, and common sense says she would have almost certainly buckled up as a condition of driving off with a citation. But the court rejected her Fourth Amendment challenge. 
Common law history suggested, and functional concerns in its view required, that police officers be treated as having lawful discretion to arrest for any offense, even ones with no jail time, if probable cause existed. Last year's Florence decision, which involved visual strip searches uh, um, at pretrial facilities, has a similar structure. No time to tell you details. But in both cases, the court rejected arguments that a more individualized approach was constitutionally required to avoid disproportionately humiliating or intrusive treatment. Now, if the Atwater case had arisen in Canada or Germany, the first question would have been, did the plaintiff have interests protected by the Fourth Amendment right? But the court didn't really begin there. Indeed, it barely mentioned, it did mention it, barely mentioned the Fourth Amendment's text, which says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Nor did the court address potential third party harm to Ms. Atwater's children. Now, whether the people can feel secure in their persons, knowing that any traffic infraction can result in their being jailed in circumstances posing a risk of harm to their kids, deserved more attention. Justifications that sound only in authority based on common law practice are not necessarily persuasive to modern ears. And that's why proportionality tests around the world do not stop with the question of authorization, but go on. The court's method, which defined the right at stake only in relation to an ambiguous common law history and an analysis of the government's interest, left an essential part of the case underexplored. Now, the court plainly engaged in some balancing in deciding to adopt a categorical rule rather than case-by-case -case analysis. The court decided police officers needed prophylactic protection because a responsible Fourth Amendment balance is not well served by standards requiring sensitive case-by-case -case determinations of government need, lest every discretionary judgment in the field be converted into an occasion for constitutional review. The court made empirical judgments concerning the supposed dearth of abusive arrests and the need to avoid, quote, systematic disincentives to make custodial arrests when needed in order to strike a, quote, responsible balance, close quote, through its categorical rule. But as the dissenters argued, qualified immunity doctrines already protected officials from monetary liability arising under unclear or uncertain standards of law. Some focus on the proportionality of the officer's conduct and the reasons, therefore, would have had little potential to interfere with bona fide law enforcement. But with little discussion of the scope of Fourth Amendment rights, no assessment of less restrictive alternatives, but a suggestion that the political process could control abuses, and reference to the possibility of a different result in more extraordinary circumstances, this decision was only partially justified and only partially transparent. Now, for comparison, I'm going to turn to one recent Canadian decision involving its constitutional protections of, quote, the right to be secure against unreasonable search or seizure and, quote, the right not to be arbitrarily detained or in prison. The case is called O'Coin. A Canadian police officer makes a traffic stop because of an irregularity in a license plate, questions the 19-year-old driver who is found to have consumed alcohol in violation of traffic laws, sensibly, prohibiting new drivers from drinking alcohol. Having decided to give the driver a ticket, the officer then decided to put the driver in the back of the police car while he wrote up the citation, and then, for safety reasons, did a pat-down and discovered unlawful drugs. The parties and the court were in agreement that the initial detention of the driver on the traffic stop was lawful. The dispositive question is whether the decision to put the driver in the back seat of the patrol car was a reasonable exercise of the authority to detain. In the court's words, the question was not whether there was authority to detain, but whether the officer was justified in exercising the authority as he did. It was, and here I'm going to quote the Canadian court, the shift in the nature and extent of detention for two relatively minor vehicle infractions that created the constitutional violation. 
end of quote. Placing the driver in the back seat of the police car, I quote again, increased restrictions on the appellant's liberty interests and altered the nature and extent of the appellant's detention in a fairly dramatic way, especially when one considers that the infractions for which he was being detained consisted of two relatively minor vehicle infractions. Thus, the court unanimously found that the detention in the car and the pat-down did not meet the test of being reasonably necessary under the circumstances. Now, Canadian law, about which I don't have time to talk further, suggests that it's possible to adopt a case-by-case -case approach to examining whether lawful authority to detain has been exercised in a reasonable or proportionate way. A comparison with Atwater suggests that some form of case-by-case -case proportionality analysis might contribute to decisions here that are both better reasoned and more protective of rights than the categorical approach we currently employ. Now let me try and just touch on three general benefits I see from judges engaging in case-by-case -case proportionality analysis based on experience elsewhere. And there are basically three I'm gonna talk about. First, it provides a stable structure for reason giving. Second, it helps bridge the roles of courts and legislatures. And third, it brings law closer to justice. And then after that, I'm gonna elaborate on a different idea, which is that attention to proportionality may help identify and respond to process deficiencies in governance and come back to Justice Marshall then. So proportionality in other, in other countries does provide, as far as I can tell, a structured and transparent mode of reason giving that produces reasons that are likely to be meaningful, possibly persuasive, and at least understandable to members of the broadening audiences for constitutional courts' interpretive decisions. Cass Sunstein has written, in American constitutional law, government must always have a reason for what it does. And Frank Michaelman's work emphasizes the connection between government reason giving and treating persons equally. Different reasons appeal to different audiences. Thus, even in the formulation of categorical rules as in Atwater, the court typically invokes at least some consequentialist understanding, their concern for law enforcement. Now the sequencing and defined order of this analysis in some foreign jurisdictions like Canada, which begins with the nature of the right, were the interests protected by the right intruded on, then turns to the government's purpose, to whether the action was authorized, and then to the rationality of the means, do they minimally impair, and do we have proportionality as such? This has been quite stable over the uh, more than 20 years, that uh, the, almost 30 years now, that the Canadian court has been doing this. It contributes to accessibility. Uh, the stability of the method and its widespread acceptance enables the Canadian justices' disagreements to focus on matters that are understandable by the parties as substantively relevant to the contested issue. Um, they make accessible what the disagreement is about. They make accessible divergent evaluations of similar factors. This sequencing of analysis may be contrasted with the more free-form evaluations that uh, we see in U.S. balancing cases like Dennis. Now, in the United States, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, different justices are going to continue to employ different methodological approaches. So some of the transparency gains of the Canadian-style approach would be lost here. Moreover, as I said before, we don't have a, a constitutional text that says you got to have a standard of justification across cases. A larger concern raised by Professor Carol Steicher in the context of preventive detention is that understanding proportionality to be a necessary condition for government action might lead to the idea that proportionality is sufficient. That is, in her wonderful words, occupying the justificatory field to the detriment of prior questions of normative justification. But in Atwater, the view that probable cause is necessary gave rise to the conclusion that it was sufficient. Now, there well may be rights or core aspects of rights that should be viewed as non-abrogable, not subject to proportionality analysis. Judicial elaborations of human dignity in Germany, for example, striking down a law authorizing the shooting down of hijacked civilian aircraft, or in Israel, prohibiting the privatization of prisons show that deontological analysis can coexist with quite extensive use of proportionality doctrine. 
Moreover, proportionality analysis itself leaves room for concluding that statutes have impermissible goals ruled out by commitments to maintaining rights in a free and democratic society. Beginning analysis, as many other courts do, with the nature of the right and its protection of the individual may also help avoid Professor Steicher's concern about the narrowing of the justificatory field. Uh, second, in addition to providing a transparent structure for reasoning, proportionality analysis, I claim, provides a useful bridge between legal decision making in courts and decision making by people in legislatures and public officials. It invites more participatory deliberation over constitutional rights and values and might achieve more compliance by legislatures and other officers with constitutional values by offering a rubric for decision making that is accessible to them. One of Professor Lawrence Tribe's critiques of Professor Ely's representation reinforcement theory of judicial review was that it offered no guidance on constitutional values or meaning to legislators or executive branch actors. The questions of proportionality analysis, especially rational relation and minimal impairment, resonate with many legislative competences. So it seems to me, and other scholars have written about this, proportionality doctrine helps reflect the dual commitments of constitutional democracies to the protection of rights and to democratic self-governance. Insisting on proper purpose and legal authority can help focus attention on the central role of legislatures in authorizing government conduct that may intrude on the realm of rights. And the sequence structure of proportionality doctrine allows for judicial deference to legislative resolution of some questions, like minimal impairment with its empirical elements, even if not all questions. Now I argue that proportionality's responsiveness to legitimate government justification enables it to both protect rights and maintain effective constitutional self-government, but some people say this very flexibility detracts from its quality as law, creating an unacceptable level of indeterminacy. Others argue, in some tension with the indeterminacy claim, that proportionality review is too intrusive on legislatures, establishing standards that can't be met. Now, there are, to be sure, institutional concerns with using general standards, like proportionality, rather than rules. First, as we all know, non-judicial actors like police may find it easier to implement a rule than a standard. But here's the thing, rules can lose their ease and clarity as exceptions proliferate. And even if categorical rules would result in fewer errors, a proportionality standard might result in fewer serious errors, fewer departures from a common sense of constitutional justice than its categorical counterpart. Second. To the extent proportionality al analysis allows more factors to be considered, the range of reasonable applications may be broader, which may result in more inconsistent conclusions in the lower courts. But here I want to say the US Supreme Court has substantial unused capacity to control error and promote consistency. The court's docket remains roughly half that what it, which it was decades ago when Justice Thurgood Marshall sat. Third. Legislatures may be more competent or have more legitimacy than courts in making some kinds of factual determinations or striking certain balances. Calibrated judicial deference, together with doctrine that encourages legislatures to engage in appropriate inquiries, I think, is a better strategy than judicial no inquiry rules. As always, critiques of indeterminacy and intrusion must be examined relatively. Compared to what? Recent experience with categorical rules in the United States suggests that neither determinacy nor respect for legislative outcomes are necessarily protected through our categorical rules. Uh, the third argument I want to make to you uh, for why this is something judges should do more of is that proportionality analysis is a structured way to bring the demands of justice into greater harmony with the law of constitutional rights. Justice is not synonymous with law. It provides a critical platform from which to evaluate law. But there is considerable value in legal systems aspiring to provide justice as it is understood in their society and coming closer to doing so. Legal systems that yield results that do not resonate with widely held conceptions of justice may not be able over the long run to perform their most basic functions. Such decisions undermine respect for law and the legitimacy of courts. <laughs>
to the extent constitutional justice is contested, application of proportionality analysis will not necessarily have determinate results, but will, I think, help clarify grounds for court's decisions. I'm moving towards the end here. Now, I'm going to turn to a different claim, and that is that disproportionality in the effects of government measures may signal process failures warranting an increased judicial role. On Professor Ely's theory, certain kinds of process failures in enacting or implementing laws warrant much higher levels of justification and scrutiny. Now, Ely was focused on process failures involving prejudice and intentional discrimination, but a wider range of process failures might be signaled by disproportionalities. Some may arise from lawmakers not caring about the disproportionate effects on the relatively powerless. Some may reflect unconscious or unarticulated prejudices, but each of these might be understood as a process failure, a failure in Justice John Paul Stevens' terms of government's duty of impartiality to all the people. Now, disproportional applications may be a necessary feature of prophylactic rules. And if there's a good enough reason to have such a rule, then courts should not fix the disproportionality because it would defeat the purpose of having the rule. But some disproportionalities signal underlying problems relating, as I've said, not only to conscious prejudice but to failures of equal regard. Now, the three-tiered structure applicable to many rights claims under U.S. equal protection and due process law of strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis, that structure may itself embody an idea of proportionality in the sense that more is required to justify laws about which we're more suspicious. Um, and as Dick Fallon has noted, the least restrictive means element of that strict scrutiny test parallels standards in proportionality elsewhere. But I think the principle of proportionality lends considerable support to Justice Thurgood Marshall's proposal that whether a classification violates equal protection depends on, quote, the nature of the classification, its relative importance to the injured party, and the government's reasons for acting. This is from Dandridge rather than on the ex-ante definitions of different categories. What prompted Justice Marshall's first articulation of this view was the court's use of rational basis review to uphold a state welfare law that imposed a cap on benefits for families with dependent children, which had the effect of giving less support to the children in larger families. For Justice Marshall, there were important differences of constitutional magnitude between classifications affecting businesses and classifications affecting poor children, differences explainable by reference to process theory. A case involving what he called, quote, the most basic economic needs of impoverished human beings should not be reviewed under mere rationality standards that accepted what he called extremes in dreaming up rational bases for state regulation because of a healthy revulsion, he said, from the court's earlier excesses, here's Lochner, in using the Constitution to protect interests that have more than enough power to protect themselves in the legislative halls. But, Justice Marshall said, where the literally vital interests of a powerless minority Poor families without breadwinners, far removed from the area of business regulation, are involved. He said, the relative importance to individuals in the class discriminated against of the governmental benefits they do not receive required more careful analysis of the reasons. Justice Marshall's emphasis on the relative importance of the rights is a plea for more proportionality in the application of standards of review and in the kinds of reasons governments must proffer for the distinctions its laws create. For similar reasons, Justice Ro Marshall famously dissented in San Antonio School District against Rodriguez, arguing that the court should have more carefully scrutinized Texas's scheme relying on local property taxes to fund the free public education the state had promised because, he wrote, discrimination against important individual interests with constitutional implications and against particularly disadvantaged or powerless classes is involved. Justice Marshall's views bear some similarity to Justice Stevens's later argument 
that there's only one equal protection clause with a common standard. Whether a legislature acting in good faith rationally could believe that the harm it was imposing was justified in support of a greater good. A single standard can be implemented with varying degrees of seriousness depending on the classification. For example, the court in Plyler v. Doe striking down a Texas statute denying public education to children illegally in the country wrote, in determining the rationality of the statute, we may appropriately take into account its cost to the nation and to the innocent children who are its victims. In light of these countervailing costs, the discrimination contained in this statute can hardly be considered rational, can hardly be considered rational unless it furthers some substantial goal of the state. The idea where the harm is great or relies on a classification associated with past invidious action, a rational legislator would need more convincing evidence of both a good purpose and likely efficacy before she could conclude that it was rational to impose the harm. This idea is consistent with both Justice Marshall and Justice Stevens' argument. Moving away from the rigid tiers of review might facilitate important shifts in the court's treatment of government policies that produce disparate impacts burdening racial minorities or women. Disproportionality and the effects of such laws may signal the kind of process failures Ely and others have written about. Rather than relying on tiers of review as on-off switches for when reasons must be substantial, under a single standard as the harm looms larger or history provides more reason for concern, disparate impact, perhaps accompanied by other obvious alternatives that would seem to correspond more with the reasons, may signal those kinds of process failures, whether of intentional invidiousness or indifferent lack of concern and equal regard, with which courts, courts ought to be primarily concerned. Now, under existing constitutional case law, disparate impact, even on racial minorities, is not treated as an important signal of this kind of failure, not even of the kind of deliberate indifference that is a close cousin to more active forms of prejudice. In Washington against Davis, the court concluded that the Equal Protection Clause was concerned only with invidiously motivated conduct, and that the lower courts had been mistaken to treat disparate impact alone as triggering heightened scrutiny. What motivated the court? An important element in the court's opinion was its concern that allowing equal protection claims based solely on a statistically disproportionate racial impact would have sweeping effects on, I'm quoting, various provisions of the Social Security Act and a whole range of tax, welfare, public service, regulatory, and licensing statutes that may be more burdensome to the poor and to the average black than to the more affluent white. So the risk of widespread invalidations from treating as, I'm gonna quote again, suspect each difference in treatment among grant classes, however lacking in racial motivation and however otherwise rational the treatment might be, led the court to hold that disproportionate impact standing alone does not trigger strict scrutiny. And I wanna suggest that the principal factor motivating the decision in Washington v. Davis were the consequences for many statutes of the usually fatal strict scrutiny tier. Given the categorical structure of tiered review at the time of this decision, the concern is understandable. But the court's more recent cases have moved away from rigid tiers. A standard focusing on the nature of the classification, the relative nature of the harm, and the governmental interests at stake would allow courts the flexibility to hold legislatures and governments to account to require some reasons without invalidating most legislation. Such a change in approach would help meet many critiques of the court's position on disparate impact, failing to recognize that disparate impact obscures much invidiously motivated conduct that does take place, failing to recognize the constitutional harm to the equal protection of the laws that can result from unconscious bias or the kind of deliberate indifference to the situation of minority groups that members of a privileged majority may have. A single standard could treat disparate impacts differently from overt or intentional uses of race 
without suggesting that a disparate impact on a minority group creates no greater constitutional concern than differences in businesses for tax purposes. The use of neutral criteria claimed to have a disparate impact on disadvantaged groups need not, in other words, be treated as presumptively unconstitutional in order to require some real scrutiny of the reasons for the practice under a single standard. Now, experience elsewhere suggests that Washington against Davis's concerns that governance would be impossible if disparate effects triggered heightened scrutiny. Uh, experience elsewhere suggests these are misplaced. For example, in the European Court of Justice, uh, violations of a constitution-like anti-discrimination rule can arise from action which has the effect of treating women and men differently. Under this standard, the court has entertained challenges to neutral employment practices claimed to have disproportionate impacts on women. It has, for example, held that a requirement that employees be available for out-of-town assignments required more justification because of the adverse effects on women who have a greater share of child rearing responsibilities. By contrast, the court accepted that pay scales based on experience were ordinarily justified despite the disproportionate effect on women. So accepting that disparate impacts may require some degree of heightened justification under equal protection law might well require changes in other aspects of that law, and in particular, the understanding of what the right to equal protection might mean. It's a complicated story. There may be other reasons not to do it. But to the extent that the definition of the right itself in Washington and Davis was motivated by a concern that to define the right to equality more broadly would put at risk the possibility of sensible government, governments, uh, the experience of other countries using proportionality analysis in equality cases suggests that that risk was overstated. All right, my last point and the most difficult one. Um, the goal of proportionality in government action in the sense of justice and good governance by actual institutions may in some cases be better served in other places and in some cases by better served by more categorical rules. So how do judges determine whether it would be better to have a more categorical or a more case-by-case -case application? I have a list of about six factors to think about. I only have time to talk with you about two. Complicated project. But first thing to think about are uh, different remedial constraints. So adjudications of liability are always nested in particular remedial systems. In the United States, for example, uh, the Fourth Amendment remedial rules seem to require exclusion of illegally seized evidence in a categorical manner. In Canada, that's not the case. Violation of charter rights does not mean automatic exclusion of evidence. Under Charter Section 24, the courts decide case by case whether admitting the evidence illegally seized would, quote, bring the administration of justice into disrepute. So the rigidity, to the extent it's rigid, of the US exclusionary rule may constrain more aggressively protective understandings of what the right entails. Now let's think about equal protection. So equal protection claims pose distinct remedial challenges as their redress um, may require changes affecting non-parties. Severability, extended times for legislative compliance, uh, there are various approaches that would need to be considered if we're going to explore this further in the equal protection area. Second factor, I call fragile rights, fragile regimes. So, there may be a need for prophylactic categorical rules, either to protect a right that's particularly fragile or possibly to protect the performance of particularly sensitive government functions. So it's widely believed that some rights are very sensitive to threats or chill and require prophylactic protection. In the United States, First Amendment freedom rights are understood to have this kind of fragility reflected in many doctrines, including overbreadth, that are departures from ordinary adjudicative practice. New York Times against Sullivan can perhaps be understood in this way. Uh, maybe it's not that there's a, a First Amendment right to be negligent in reporting adverse facts about a public figure, but there is a First Amendment right to engage in robust critical discussion of public figures, and that right might be threatened if reporters' actions are adjudicated under only a negligence standard. Thus, plaintiffs have to make a stronger showing of malice or reckless disregard. 
Now, if prophylactic rules are sometimes necessary to protect unusually fragile rights, maybe they are also necessary to protect important government functions. And actually, many prophylactic rules exist that intrude on rights and protect government functions. Think about filing deadlines, which both limit access to judicial review, but in another sense, enable it. Qualified immunity rules and the move since the 1970s to so-called objective standards of immunity uh, have been justified as necessary to provide space for officers uh, to perform their executive functions. And these general categorical rules might well be upheld through proportionality analysis. Returning for a moment to Atwater. If there were no less rights-impairing alternative that as effectively advances legitimate law enforcement interests, and the harm to protected constitutional rights was outweighed by the need to advance those interests, a categorical arrest on probable cause rule could be upheld. But an opinion under the Canadian or German or Israeli approach would have taken much fuller account of the individual interests at stake, and in so doing might have written at least a more convincing opinion than one that focuses on the common law authority for the law enforcement rule. Now maybe we could think about the decision in Atwater as a form of empirical humility, uh, the court deferring to the presumed expertise of the police. Perhaps it could be regarded as manifesting respect for democratic federalism, notwithstanding other case law treating authority under state law as irrelevant to the Fourth Amendment. But at the same time, given very high incarceration rates in the United States, and evidence that the criminal justice system falls with far greater severity on members of already disadvantaged groups, many of whom may not have the access to courts that Ms. Atwater did. It is by no means clear to me that law enforcement officers here need more, rather than less, insulation from having to justify their actions in court when challenged on constitutional grounds. To sum up, is proportionality part of US constitutional tradition? Yes. Might we draw more heavily on it to resolve important constitutional questions? Again, I say yes. But embracing proportionality as a principle does not necessarily tell you to always do it in a case-by-case -case way. Proportionate justice could be expressed in the formulation of a categorical rule or through contextualized case-by-case -case determinations. How to decide which way, which is um, involved in the standards rules debate, is difficult, and I've only begun to touch on it, but I'm about to end my talk. Reorienting US constitutional adjudication is a complex proposition. Using prop proportionality to define violations does not, of course, dictate remedies, nor does it exclude definitions of rights based on separate deontological or historical concerns. But as a step to bringing US constitutional law closer to US conceptions of justice, within the constraints of a very heterogeneous population with many conceptions of justice, and doing so in ways consistent with the demands of effective government, proportionality with some attention to how it's been developed elsewhere could be very useful. And if we are proportional in our application of proportionality, we may be able to improve some much criticized areas of constitutional law while avoiding the major risks that motivated those decisions. Justice Marshall looked to the law for justice. He saw clear-eyed that law did not always provide justice, but he did not stop looking, nor should we. Thank you. Answer. Part of the trans one of the reasons is 
part of the transparency effects that I have seen in systems, can you hear me in the back? That I've seen in systems like Canada um, or Israel uh, or Germany is that the, the justices are not arguing about their methodology. They are applying. Is there a legitimate purpose? Is there authority? Is there rationality? Is there minimal impairment? Uh, there are some great opinions in Canada where there's tremendous disagreement on this, and it's completely clear what the disagreement is about. So I see that as almost being more of a barrier here to those transparency benefits than um, the possible application of categorical rules in some areas as compared to others. But um, I do think that even in the development of categorical rules, um, there would be a gain from more uh, candid and complete discussion of the rights side and the government interests side. Uh, uh, when students read, uh, uh, there are two hate speech cases I often teach. One is a US case called RAV, and the other is this Canadian case called Keekstra. And they're both very divided. But the, the students, whether they think hate speech, whether they think you know, the First Amendment overall, of course you can't prohibit speech because it's hateful, or they have the attitude of, of course, how could you not prohibit it? I've had, I have both kinds of students. They find the Canadian case, they understand what the justices are arguing about. They don't understand the significance of content-based, viewpoint-based distinction discussions in RIV because the court is so caught up in the existing categories. It doesn't explain what they're really trying to do. So, although you ask a very good question, and I don't have a complete answer for it, I do think that being more aware of how other systems have approached proportionality um, would improve our ability to to apply either standards on a case-by-case -case basis or to establish broader rules that will more generally constrain. Other questions? Can, can we have it? So, Professor Black. <laughs> so, Vicki, if you were appointed to the court. Um, <laughs> In your dreams, right? <laughs> um, and you have continued of these views, which I agree with. How would you go about, or would you start writing as if you were in Canada? No. And say, <laughs> hope that the other eight will see the light, or how would you do it? Well, that, that's a great uh, question. No, as, as, you, as you know, because we're, we're good friends as well as colleagues, I actually believe in stare decisis and predictability, and I believe that you're, you're never starting on a fresh slate. And um, so uh, I would find that a question, I couldn't give you an answer across all of the cases. There may be areas with relatively um, stable rules that people seem to know and, uh, and work on. I mean, uh, revisiting, for example, revisiting Miranda after Dickerson and all the TV <coughs> detective shows. I mean, everybody knows the story, whether it really makes sense and really is the best approach now. I'm not sure that would be one I'd think about revisiting. So I think if you're a judge, and any judge on the court comes to it, or, or, or ought to come to it, with an awareness of the things that are more or less settled. This is not to say you can't take aim at things that are settled, but I think you can't take aim at everything that's settled if you're going to be a good constitutional court judge in an ongoing system. Uh, that's what I think. I answered your question. Okay, well, not anything. Again, thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Other questions? <coughs> Alan? How does, in, in a world, and I, I don't know whether Canada and Germany are as crazy as we are at this time, but in this country, everybody increasingly has their own set of empirical understandings. So that, for example, a legislature considering welfare We'll have some people who say, people won't eat, and this is crazy. And other people will say, it is good for them, because otherwise they will be stuck in this trap of incentivized poverty. How does the court dive into that to determine what is proportional or minimal harm? One, one thing a court could do would be actually to take a look at what the legislature has and has not done. It could take a look at the seriousness of the inquiry. I'm going a little bit beyond this talk. 
but there are many constitutional courts that do that. And there are some issues on which I think judicial deference is ordinarily going to be a sensible posture to take. On um, deep divisions over factual stuff that are bona fide, you have decent scientists, decent economists on both sides, legislature hears them out, makes a decision, you're a court. I think you owe deference to that. Uh, that is not to say that legislative processes over nominally contested issues are always of that character. Uh, and so there may be cases where legislatures make what I would call um, obviously fictitious findings. Uh, here's an example. The Supreme Court of the United States, in a case that upheld a federal statute regulating abortion, did conclude that when Congress found that no medical schools taught a procedure, it was in error. Yale, Harvard, Michigan, I forget, but it was a, it was a pretty, um, uh, it was not one. Uh, so, so, you know, but if, if you've got a reasonably good faith legislative process in a contested fact area, it's not the court's job uh, to, to reevaluate that. Uh, absent tremendous talk to lots of, but, but it's hard to imagine you'd have that if the legislature had done a decent job. Well, I, I, I've had this problem. I've been teaching con law. You know, talking about Congress and Section Five, and it, it's it's challenging week. But we all have enough. <laughs> can, can I ask? Yes. Yeah. So I find this fascinating. It's a wonderful lecture. Thank you um, so much. Um, it strikes me that all of these debates are predicated on a lot of empirical assumptions. With many of the empirical assumptions being assumptions about human nature, the way people, legislators, and judges will respond to particular uh, situations. It strikes me, is this right, uh, that your view is rested on a deeply optimistic view about the <coughs> likely psychology and capacity of judges, uh, that if we have Judges who have the right values and the right sorts of sensitivities, then all we have to do is to give them greater flexibility to take into account all of the considerations that would be relevant to justice, and they'll bring us closer and closer and closer to justice. Whereas people who are less trustful of judges' capacity to bring us closer and closer and closer to justice, who want to restrain judicial capacity uh, through the intentions of the framers or the original public meaning or rules or something of the kind. So you're the grand optimist about judges is this right? I have been accused of being an optimist about many things. <laughs> so I'm not going to deny that there is a strand there. But I look at what we've gotten in an era dominated by um, the rule of laws, the law of rules, originalism, new originalism, old originalism. I don't see a lot of restraint. I don't see a lot of justice. And ultimately, it is judges who make, whether they're rules or standards, judges at the top decide. Uh, and I really, uh, so I don't think it's any kind of blind optimism. I think it is in part, as I tried to indicate, that I think the success of some of the more categorical approaches is in doubt. Uh, and that uh, the harms that people worried about, about setting judges loose with a proportionality standard, have been mitigated. They're not gone. But, but actually, there's been learning and law. I think the proportionality standard, as I've described it, actually works better than just balancing. So I don't know that it's blind up. I don't know that I, I don't think judges are Hercules at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Todd and then Nancy, oh, and Larry, oh gosh, we have time for you? Great. Uh, so I'm going to restate the lot point, all right? The, the one place it does seem to be a categorical approach seems to work, for my life, is to make it easy to start the assumption that basic economic regulation is going to be okay. And are you not afraid, it's, it's a, insofar as economic liberty is still part of the constitutionally protected by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment, are you not afraid 
of converting minimal scrutiny into proportionality, that you might open up something which is well settled in the right direction? Can you restate the question, please? Yeah, it's a great question. So Todd Rakoff asks whether there isn't a big risk in opening up to more than rational basis scrutiny economic regulation that really ought to be at that level. Well, I have two thoughts, many thoughts. One is I think there is a risk. Yes. I think we've already seen, however, the infiltration of economic interests into other areas of the law in ways that give enormous protection to great accumulations of money power. So I don't know if that means that you know rational basis in the area of, of other kinds of economic regulations is still doing a lot of work. Maybe it is. So that might be something to worry about. But then you would have people having a head-on discussion, Todd, of is it more important for the court to interfere to protect optometrists from being put out of business by opticians, or whichever way it was. Well, you know, if you think about it, businesses can reform. People can do lots of other things. Or is it more important that we feed these children who are being excluded for reasons not their own? So I think in proportionality under a single standard, you can have a discussion about the values that led to that deferential review. And so I don't think the risk is really, really high, but I may be wrong. Uh, can I go to Larry next sure. and then to Nancy? Larry. Well, first of all, I too want to thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, and I want, whether it was opticians or optometrists, to say that I think both Dick Fallon's question and Todd Rakoff's question reflect that optical illusion. <laughs> 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 I, I think if I understand your lecture correctly, you've shown, and with the additions of reminding us of how little work new originalism and old originalism and textualism and even the economic, non-economic distinction after commercial speech and Citizens United, how little work those things have done to achieve any modicum of predictability, reasonableness, accommodation to pessimists as well as optimists. Seems to me, in light of that, a large part of your answer needs to be that you're not advocating necessarily all things considered review. You're structuring it. The question is whether the structure you are imposing is more transparent, less illusory, more likely over time when it's introduced not all at once as though we were writing on a clean slate, but in light of areas by areas, what is already stable and established, what isn't, whether it isn't more likely over time to produce both the benefits of restraint on um, judges run wild that Dick Fallon is talking about, and the benefits of keeping stable those areas where we can now predict judges will not intervene too much. And for my money, it seems to me you've made a very compelling case of a comparative advantage in that respect. So I thank you again. Well, thank you. Can I ask you to finish writing this? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, very much. You can't be sure. You can't be sure. I, I sometimes say I'm sort of a common law lawyer, and I like to look at cases and learn from experience. So I am, I'm influenced by having really for the last um, 15 or 20 years kind of reading regularly in several other jurisdictions and just watching courts decide things and, and watching how disputes get handled. Um, and I could be wrong, or it could all change, but that's the basis on which I've drawn my conclusions and tried to argue. Thank you so much for your comment. Nancy? I, I think mine was a version of, of that, which is you talked about sort of the opposition to proportional review as essentially a fear of judging, a fear of subjective judgments, um, and that what you're proposing is a methodology that would make judgments more transparent. This is what Larry was saying. The, the, and I think that this is sort of a version of what everyone is saying. But that methodology in the United States will then be, assuming it happened tomorrow, transposed on a very divided court. And once you admit to categorical rules, to what extent will that methodology just become another rationalization for the rules we already have?
Uh, well, Nancy, it might. I can't rule out the possibility. Um, but, um, and here we're back to the, um, am I an optimist or am I a pessimist? And I, I think it's happier to live if you're a bit of an optimist. <laughs> and, and I think that um, Justice Breyer, I think, thinks there's a possibility. He actually uses the words proportionality review in the concurrence in the Alvarez case. And there, it was a necessary, it was a, there was a four, plurality of four, and he wrote, joined by Justice Kagan, so necessary for the judgment, uh, evaluating the statute that was challenged there on First Amendment grounds under what he called a proportionality. Now, he didn't do the, the whole thing, but I, I think he sees a, that there may be some open. And um, I think that having a little bit more experience with it, um, we find out. Does it work differently? Does it modulate some of the sharpness? Does it at least make more clear to the public what the stakes are in these cases? That would be my that would be my hope. If I mean, has a question. Oh, please. Well, uh, thank you so much and congratulations. Um, I ask an, as an outsider, a non-US person, which uh, I think you were part two in your presentation, you go to Canada, Israel, and Germany. Um, and I think it is precisely because of people who do comparative law have to play a leading role uh, globally. What I don't understand is when I first came to the US, the first judge that I discovered was Justice Scalia. And his attitude towards international law and foreign law uh, is not encouraging for those coming from <laughs> other places. And my question is American scholars like uh, Professor Tribe, Matt Mino, and many others here are interested in comparative law and what is going on in other jurisdictions. Where do you see the U.S. Supreme Court going in terms of uh, their attitude towards what is happening in other jurisdictions? You have persuasively uh, made a case that there are many good things that are happening elsewhere that the U.S. Supreme Court should pay attention to. What do you think is their direction? And if at all this proposal you are making is going to be accepted, will it be in light of what is happening elsewhere or because of the kind of argument that you are making? So, great question. <laughs> Thank you for it. I think over the course of time, there's no question but that members of the U.S. Supreme Court, like members of high courts around the world, in South Africa, Israel, Germany, Canada, the U.K., Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, uh, are becoming increasingly aware of foreign constitutional law. It may not always be reflected in their opinions, uh, but I am quite sure awareness is increasing. Think about who they hire as their law clerks. They hire as their law clerks, for the most part, students who go to schools like Harvard, which have faculty who are exposing them increasingly to international law, to comparative law. Uh, does the U.S. court have a steeper learning curve to climb than, say, the courts in South Africa, Israel, Canada, and Germany? Yes. Because they haven't uh, been in the environment where they've had the incentives to learn about foreign law, and still the incentives are quite different. Um, my, I've, I've done a little bit of a study of the use of foreign and international law in the U.S. Supreme Court over time. And uh, when I first started studying this, I've said this before, Justice Scalia, who writes so convincingly, pulled the wool over my eyes a little bit. Because he actually had me thinking that the US court didn't look at foreign law, but it turns out that's wrong. It turns out that if you look, uh, that there's a period from 1970 when Thurgood Marshall cited the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Dandridge. From 1970 until sometime in the late 1990s, the US court goes silent on international law and foreign law and constitutional cases. It has to do with a couple of things. One is who happens to be on the court. And a very interesting paper by a young scholar named David Fontana argues that the court is drawn inward by the preoccupations of the Warren Court and the internal legitimacy questions that raised. But since the mid-90s, Justice Breyer writes about European federalism in the Prince case in 1997, Justice Scalia says that's irrelevant. 
Uh, the court writes about uh, other countries' position on the death penalty in the Atkins case and the majority, and Justice Scalia and Justice Rehnquist <coughs> write to said, say, that's irrelevant. Um, and so there's a fight going on about the relevance. But I, I have no doubt, again, you know, I'm an optimist, that over the course of time, as more of our law students learn more about the significance of international law and developments in foreign countries, it will infiltrate. Now that doesn't mean, to answer the last part of your question, it doesn't mean that I expect that the U.S. Supreme Court law will come to be more like that of other countries. I think there are areas where we have long traditions of doing things in a certain way that people think work reasonably well and are unlikely to change. Might there be areas of convergence? Yes. Might there be areas of divergence? Yes, but at least it will be knowing, more known divergence based on knowledge rather than ignorance. That, that's my thoughts. Vicki, you have given us a feast, and I have one more thing to do. Oh, there are more questions? There's one. Uh, it's the one last, one sure. last. Okay, one last question. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm new to the system. Uh, I just want to ask one question about the jurisdiction of more of the Supreme Court, jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in international and uh, projects of United States. Like uh, right now, United States has um, army in Iraq, um, Guatemala, or across the world with ships and activities. So, what do you really think about? Uh, these activities and does the Supreme Court have the jurisdiction in light of the case of the Karkas, uh, I'm sorry, the pronunciation is wrong, well, the Paraguay case and uh, where and uh, no. yes, yeah, if you can. So, so yeah. I can very briefly, so yeah. the US Supreme Court, unlike the Israeli court or the German court, has a political question doctrine that, and justiciability limits that are technical, com uh, complicated, and old, that have prevented it from deciding many cases in the area of foreign affairs and military deployments that constitutional courts in some other countries do address. Um, and so that's the beginning of an answer of your question, and I think we're out of time on doing more, but I'd be happy to talk with you more afterwards. I am going to do one more thing, which is um, create a photo opportunity and another occasion for you to be embarrassed. But as I do so, I will invite the, gra the crowd to give a response proportionate <laughs> to the uh, quality of this really wonderful, wonderful lecture.